Great. Good afternoon. I want to welcome you all to Brookings, and I thank you all for joining us virtually today. Uh, my name is Amy Liu, and I'm a presidential advisor and senior fellow here at Brookings. And one of my responsibilities here is to oversee some critical cross-institution uh, initiatives of which one of the most pressing is the governance of AI and emerging technologies, or what we call AIET. So what that means is there are researchers across all five of our programs that are working together to examine a whole slew of issues that help local, national, and international actors better mitigate the risks of AI while assuring its promise. Now, to give you a flavor of what that looks like, um, I want to share a couple things about what the Brookings AI to ET initiative is currently tackling. For instance, uh, we have scholars mapping the geography of AI industries to assess regions readiness to embrace and manage tech growth. Uh, analyzing specific tasks and occupations to understand how and where human skills can augment AI rather than be replaced by it. Uh, interrogating racial bias in the mass gathering of text and data in machine learning and in AI algorithmic designs and execution. Uh, there are scholars that are thinking about how to set up potential norms and standards governing the military applications and use of AI and of course, determining the right forms for international cooperation on AI governance. That, that just gives you a sampling of all the inquiries that are underway here at Brookings around AI and emerging technologies. Today, we are gathered, this afternoon, we are gathered to discuss yet another AIET concern, which I believe you all share, which is why you're here with us today. And that is the impact of generative AI and other novel online threats to global elections in 2024. Now on this, let me just to say that in the past year and even in the past few weeks, we've seen generative AI in action. It was used to suppress voting in New Hampshire. It was used to destabilize a parliamentary election in Slovakia. And the mere existence of AI generated content has an enabled political figures currently running for office to blame deep fakes and deny the authenticity of their prior statements and actions. So these incidents offer a glimpse into the information age we now see ourselves in. AI generated content can pose real threats during an election season, yes, and they can foment confusion about what is real or not including casting doubt on authentic information and content. Now further, false content continues to circulate widely online without the use of generated outputs. And according to new analysis today, uh, analysis that's released by today's moderator, Valerie Warshafta, AI generated media comprised only 1% of the content, uh, content that's been contested and flagged by users across X, which you all know is the platform formerly called Twitter. So in other words, AI generated content represents a very small fraction of all the contested information that circulates online. Instead, the overwhelming volume of contested content online continues to primarily be recycled or decontextualized images and fabricated claims shared by actors who probably simply want to profit off the incentive structures to go viral. So I believe Valerie's paper, which is entitled The Impact of Generative AI in a Global Election Year, which was released last week, by the way, so you can all find it online and probably on this event page. I think that paper really sets up today's program very well. It raises key questions and points of tension in our digital, political, and cultural environment today that I hope this phenomenal panel will help us unpack. And let me just reiterate what I think some of those questions are. One is how can we properly mitigate the real threats to AI disinformation and disinformation overall at a time when frankly, many social media platforms are beginning to unwind content moderation efforts. 
how can we properly size the scale of the threat without sowing distrust in all information, especially when U.S. trust in mass media remains at a historic low? And lastly, what is the proper balance of efforts to regulate the AI technology itself and addressing other factors in the ecosystem, especially when AI-generated content can actually be a force for good, uh, such as speeding up, improving, and reducing the cost of election outreach efforts for many candidates. So to help us understand these questions, we have assembled a fantastic panel with expertise in information operations, social media platform regulations, and artificial intelligence. And so I am now pleased to turn things over to my very capable colleague, Valerie Warshafta. She's a fellow in foreign policy at Brookings and a member of the AI and Emerging Technology Initiative here. And she's gonna introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion. So Valerie, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Amy, and thank you all for joining this conversation. Given the stellar lineup we've assembled for this panel today, I did want to dive in right into the conversation. But before we do that, I should also note that we have already received some great questions, but those who are watching today are welcome to submit additional ones via email to events at brookings.edu or on X using the hashtag AI and elections. And I'll try to incorporate these questions as they come in as best as I can. So to kick us off, um, I actually think, you know, to, to set the stage a little bit, to just have each panelist maybe briefly share a little bit about their background. Um, and then in that context, what they're specifically watching in this space over the next year. So how about maybe we start with Arvind, we can start with you, and then we can have Laura, Olga, and then lastly, my Brookings colleague, Quinta. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be part of this panel. My name is Arvind Narayanan. I'm a computer science professor at Princeton, and I'm also the director of the Center for Information Technology Policy here. Uh, my research is on AI. A lot of what I look at is AI hype. I try to critically look at the evidence to see if some of the claims made about AI capabilities are in fact justified. And in that context, I've also been looking at whether some of the fears about AI and elections are also justified. Uh, I think there is certainly a lot to talk about, but I think we should be careful about alarmism. And I'm very glad that this panel has been framed in a very kind of even keeled way. Uh, so with that context, let me briefly mention three things that I'm watching. So to me, the concerns about the normalization of unreliable information that Amy mentioned resonate a lot more than the concerns about malicious actors using AI to cause catastrophic damage to elections, for instance. And the so-called liar's dividend is not just about elections. It's even simple things like when I'm watching a video of someone doing something amazing, you know, let's say parkour a year ago, that would have seemed really amazing. Today, it's like, you know, that was probably AI, right? So it just completely changes the nature of online interaction. So that's number one. So very quickly, number two is the use of AI by authoritarian governments. So, for instance, uh, you know, some countries are going to be saying, if you want to offer chatbots in our country, then it has to have a pro-government position. That's a very different kind of information harm than some of the ones that get a lot more attention. Uh, that's already the reality in China, almost needless to say. But, uh, you know, I wonder how many countries are going to follow suit. And so uh, the third one is I want to think about how people are adapting to all this. You know, sometimes the disinformation discourse treats people as kind of naive rubes, you know, that it, it reminds me of the, like the old uh, debunked media effects theories 70 years ago, where people believed in subliminal information and that sort of thing. We know, of course, that that's not the case. People are aware of the potential of AI generated deepfakes. They are adapting to it. How are they adapting to it? That I think is a really interesting empirical question. Thank you. Wonderful. How about you, Laura? Hey folks, uh, my name is Laura Edelson. I am also a professor of computer science. Um, I am at Northeastern University. Um, I study how political uh, communication and mis and disinformation spread in large online networks. So I don't specifically, um, I am not specifically an AI researcher, but AI uh, is clearly changing 
the face of mis and disinformation, and it's clearly having a, a major impact on the way uh, social networks function. So I think that's where um, my perspective is a little bit different from Arvin's. Um, you know, as as Amy talked about in the introduction, uh, AI generated content is it is already here. It is already impacting the space, and to me, some of the things that I am thinking about um, for this election cycle is, um, you know, one, I think we, I think that um, different platforms have a different level of vulnerability to um, AI generated misleading content for some of the reasons around, you know, staffing um, and just resourcing the teams that might, um, you know, make these systems resilient against these kinds of attacks. Um, and I think better understanding what platforms, you know, themselves are more vulnerable is something that's going to be really important this year. And then I think the other thing um, that I know I'm going to be spending a lot of time on this year and I think is really promising is many of the same uh, core models that are being used to generate AI content can actually be used to detect the same content. Um, I think some of the uh, work around um, uh, the the particular task is called stance detection, for, uh, where you can use large language models to cluster together many similar, uh, particularly conspiracy theory claims. I think that that's an approach that uh, has a lot of promise. I think there are other similarly promising approaches to help platforms identify AI generated video or audio uh, much sooner than they than they can uh, with manual methods. I think those things have a lot of promise. I think the thing that I'm most worried about is, you know, can we build those systems fast enough uh, to meet the threat? Super. I definitely want to go back to some of the mitigation tools as we think about solutions in this space, because we can talk a lot about the various challenges, but I will definitely draw you out on the solutions, all of you, um, a bit more down toward the, toward the end of our conversation. Um, sorry, Olga, how about you? Thank you so much for having me in this conversation uh, with um, so many wonderful um, people who write about this and research it. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Olga Belaglova, and I am the director of the Emerging Technologies Initiative at Johns Hopkins SAIS. Um, what does that actually mean? Uh, so uh, this is a relatively new initiative at SAIS um, where um, we are really trying to understand how um, to teach and stimulate research in um, governance of emerging technologies, and that includes artificial intelligence, but other technologies as well, like biotechnology and space technology, and sort of leveraging the sort of history of Johns Hopkins University being the first America's research institution and so many of the um, colleagues I have at um, the School of Engineering, Applied Physics Laboratory, and other parts of the institution that have expertise in that. Uh, but I also am a professor at the Elperovich Institute for Cybersecurity Studies here at SAIS, um, where I teach um, about disinformation and influence in the digital age. Um, but we also do talk about history and the history of influence operations throughout time, which I'm certainly happy to talk about today um, and how it relates to what we, we see these days. Um, um, but prior to my work um, at um, at Johns Hopkins, um, I led the policy work at Meta, the company formerly known as Facebook, um, on countering influence operations. And the policy um, that um, is most famous that I worked on was the coordinated inauthentic behavior policy um, and so how we sort of wrap our arms around um, troll farms and those that are um, state and non-state actors that are engaging in that kind of manipulation as well as policies related to state controlled media, um, uh, hack and leak operations and other things that are influence operations threats. Importantly, a lot of that work is distinct um, from work on misinformation um, and that's for a reason. And it's a reason that we can certainly talk about today um, because you know we should be talking about artificial intelligence and generative AI when it comes to sort of the average um, uh, person engaging with it versus a threat actor. Um, and so some main questions that I think would be worth discussing are, you know, who will actually use um, these technologies, right? Um, will it be spammers and scammers, or will it be sort of the um, threat actors um, uh, working for um, state governments and others? Um, uh, how will it be successful, uh, right? One of the things um, uh, to speak to Arvin's point about um, hype that I'm genuinely concerned about having studied Russian influence operations for years um, is 
the fact that sometimes the threat actors are more interested in getting us to believe in nothing at all rather than to believe anything in particular. Um, uh, and that's something that I've seen from studying Russian military intelligence as well as the Internet Research Agency and other troll farms. Um, and so how does the sort of um, specter of the generative AI threat to elections play a role in that? Well, let's look at some of the headlines that we've seen over the last um, couple of weeks, couple of days. Um, the terms that are used when talking about elections and artificial intelligence outside of um, uh, this panel, at least, have been flood, apocalypse, um, uh, all kinds of different terms that are saying that the world is about to end because generative AI is going to be used in elections. Um, so I think it's important to also think about the way that plays in our societal understanding of information um, and some of those normative questions that were um, um, asked by Amy at the beginning of um, the conversation, right? How many of our problems are fundamentally problems that are different because of artificial intelligence and new techniques and how many of them are things that we have been concerned about before. Um, and I'll also add one uh, one anecdote that I've been sharing. I think others probably have heard it or shared it before is um, sort of comparing our moment to other moments in time. I think it's always interesting to look back at history. I just uh, had a lecture last week with my students talking about sort of the evolution of the information environment, including things like the printing press and the radio and moments in time where sort of human beings were um, scared by new technologies and how they reacted to that. Um, and one recent one is, of course, the invention of Photoshop, right? The conversations that people were having after Photoshop was released in 1988 were quite similar to the ones we're having today. That's super. I, I was typing some of the questions to you. You added questions to my list of questions to ask you all. So thank you very much for that. Um, Quinta, to you. Thank you so much. And it's great to be here, especially with such a wonderful panel. Um, so I'm Quinta Jurassic. I am a fellow in governance studies at Brookings. I'm also a senior editor at Lawfare. Um, and I'm coming to this from the perspective of someone who writes about internet and tech policy, but also someone who's spent the last few years really trying to think and write about uh, democracy, specifically in the United States, but around the world and the rule of law. Um, and of course, those we have seen how all of these things really uh, overlap, unfortunately. <laughs> um, in the last few years, I first started getting interested in this actually uh, because of covering the Mueller investigation as it unfolded. Um, and so, you know, really looking at what we were learning about the Internet Research Agency's um, online influence operation, the GRU hack and leak in 2016. And so in terms of, you know, what I'm keeping an eye on going forward, I think that it's helpful to kind of look back at 2016 and think about where we were then and where we've come. Um, so in 2016, I think what, what sort of happened is that uh, societally, the United States was kind of caught with its pants down with Russian uh, misinformation, both in the sense that, you know, the government sort of wasn't really prepared for it, didn't know how to deal with it. Um, tech companies weren't receiving the uh, collaboration with the government that was sort of necessary to cut this off at the pass. And then when the news did break that this had been happening, there was a sort of uh, panic is too strong, but a, a huge amount of political and cultural anxiety around, you know, the fact that these Russian trolls had been posting on Twitter and Facebook that I think we now know was probably out of proportion uh, with the effect that that actually had on votes. But it did kind of move uh, political and cultural attention in, in Washington, D.C. and in Silicon Valley toward addressing these problems of thinking about uh, misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, <laughs> acknowledging that these are complicated terms, but just using them as a shorthand. And I think what you saw then in 2018 and 2020 was a sort of increased awareness that uh, foreign influence operations were a problem, that they were something that should be dealt with. Um, and in 2020, I think this is complicated by the fact that suddenly you start seeing a lot of falsehoods uh, circulating in public discourse that are not coming from abroad, uh, that are coming from within the United States, that are not being you know, originated by someone sitting at a keyboard uh, in St. Petersburg being paid to, to spread falsehoods, but are being originated and spread by people who genuinely believe in them, who really do believe that, you know, ballots are being stolen um, or altered in some way. And I think that has kind of led us into this question of, OK, so what do we do, you know, thinking about a political environment that is shaped by, you know, uncertainty about what is true and false, uh, where that uncertainty is not only coming from abroad, um, 
but coming from within. And that I think has made the question of how to deal with this a lot harder um, because it's you can't simply draw a line and say, you know, anything that comes in from over the water uh, is something that is fair game to sort of remove. Um, and so going into 2024, I think that the the conversation around generative AI sort of folds into what I think is a, a larger cultural moment of sort of uncertainty around how we think about truth um, and who is empowered to determine what is and isn't true. Um, and I, I do think that, you know, as, as we've all kind of said, one of the big questions is whether we're going to be able to avoid as a society kind of doing what we did in 2016 um, and sort of panicking about how, you know, all nothing is true. All of reality is being shaped by these, you know, these pieces of information that that may not actually be be based on anything. I'm I'm hopeful based on the tenor of this conversation so far that, you know, we've come far enough that we're able to kind of address this issue soberly. But I do think that these these are all additional layers that I'm thinking about when I consider how to address these questions. Super. Thank you all. So, I mean, you know, kind of building on some of the framing that Olga put out there earlier and also what Quinta just perfectly teed me up for is, you know, we've we've heard about this disinformation nightmare. Um, and, you know, the World Economic Forum this year, they said that uh, mis- and disinformation, particularly in the context of generative AI, is um, a clear and present danger over the next two years, this sort of short term danger. And so, I'm, you know, recognizing that there are real issues at stake here. There are real challenges to the information space. We already hadn't figured it out. There were tech companies that were already getting a bit squeamish about some of these questions. And then we throw in a new type of content here that just kind of complicates the entire space. So I'm hoping we can take a little bit of time to, to kind of level set the challenge a little bit. I know Arvind had started to do this a bit in his earlier remarks. Um, but just, you know, in, in the view of whomever would like to go first, um, just how different of a threat is generative AI? Is it sort of additive? In my report, I tried to think about ways potentially that it was slightly different in certain areas and then mostly additive um, to sort of the dynamics that we'd already seen before. So I'm just kind of curious um, from this group what you all think about that, um, where concerns are maybe being exaggerated. Again, I know Arvind had hit on this a little bit. Things we're not paying enough attention to. Uh, variations potentially from country to country. Um, and then maybe I'll also throw one more in there, Olga, to lift your question. Who might use these um, and, and and will they be successful or what, what kind of success can we expect? So I'm not sure um, who would like to kick us off. Arvin, maybe if you want to kick us off there since you sort of started getting into this a little bit or whomever really, because um, you all kind of touched on various aspects of this in a really nice way. I see Laura is unmuted. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I mean, I, I think about this a lot. Um, you know, so I think, uh, you know, some folks were, someone, I forget, maybe it was Olga was talking about, you know, in the early days of Photoshop, um, that this was, you know, like a revelation, you know, but it goes back much further than that, right? In the early days of photography, there were the the Cotlington fairies. Um, and, and, and the thing is that those earlier fakes, they did actually convince people. And then as a society, we gained a broader understanding of how technology works and we adjusted. And the problem that we are all dealing with is the fact that that takes time. And so the question is always, you know, what's gonna be the cost in this intermediate period when we're all adapting to this new reality that we're all living in? And, you know, I, um, you know, so to your question around like, what's different? Um, I think the actual capability isn't that different, just in the sense that, you know, we've been talking for years about cheat fix. And um, something that I found really heartening a couple of years ago in the early days of the Ukraine war, um, Russia tried putting out a deep fake of uh, uh, President Zelensky, and it was bad. It was terrible. And I remember thinking like, okay, we have really we have we have hit a good moment culturally where there is a broad understanding on the part of uh, people in the media that if they get a video that isn't substantiated that they need to ask where it comes from and the and that um that awareness on at least many people's part has happened before the technology got to a point where um a really motivated state actor uh when they have a lot of footage of a potential target and a lot of 
you know, money and motivation to make a high quality deep fake, they still make one that looks this bad. Um, and I thought, you know, okay, I think, I think this is, uh, I think we're in not as bad a position as we might have been. Um, but I think what's really different about where we've gotten to is that the ability to make a plausible deep fake is just not in the hands of state actors anymore. And it is not in the hands of, uh, you know, someone who can pay for a good Photoshop job or someone who can pay a compelling voice actor. It's in the hands of every single person on the Internet. And that just changes the dynamic that changes the threat model when the uh, when the threat actor is everyone. And, you know, speaking to your question, Olga, of who will use these, I mean, it's like the question of asking of like, who's going to use a Ford F-150 or who is going to use an AK-47 or an AR-15, you know, these are tools, they're going to be widely used, uh, both for legitimate good uh, purposes and also some bad ones, right? That's the nature of things that are both tools and weapons. Um, you know, but all of that said, uh, and you, if you want to say like, what's actually different, I think the difference that I am focused on, and I'm trying to think about how to manage is the difference of scale, right? It is now the the cost to produce, uh, you know, to produce cheap fakes scales with the number of items you need to make. If you want to make a new uh, fake uh, audio recording, then you need to pay that voice actor for more time in the studio, or, you know, you need to pay that designer to make more photoshops or whatever it is. Uh, but the cost to produce more fake generative AI content is internet scale. It's pretty close to flat. And I think um, this, in addition to the, you know, the, frankly, the pretty good quality of the commercially available tools just changes um, who is a relevant threat actor, and it changes the scale of the potential threat. If I might step in here, it's a good moment to talk about the who part um, uh, because uh, Laura set it up so well. But uh, but one thing I think is quite interesting, if we point to uh, the conversation we just had about the Zelensky cheap fake, right? Um, there's actually no evidence to support who actually created it. Um, as a society, we make an assumption that it was a highly motivated state actor, but there's actually no evidence to say that it was the Russians, so to speak. Um, I spent years as an investigator on the threat intelligence team at Facebook investigating Russian influence operations. And I can't tell you how many times people said that the Russians, quote unquote, were behind something that they didn't deserve the credit for. Um, and so I think that's a part of this conversation, too. It's not only who will use it, but who we will assume is using it. Um, that also speaks to, um, you know, point that uh, Quinta was making earlier about, you know, falsehoods coming from abroad, right? So much of what both during the Cold War and in the present day Russian influence operations um, are taking advantage of existing narratives in society and wedges in those societies. They aren't inventing problems. They're sort of leveraging them for their campaigns. And so I think it's, you know, um, the who is important because oftentimes this conversation gets caught up in making assumptions about who the who is. <laughs> um, and as Laura rightly said, it, everybody is using technology that becomes available to them. Um, and so the, the other reason that I pose that question is, you know, sort of from my research, um, uh, I think looking at influence operations that um, social media companies have identified over the years, um, some of them, you know, dating back to maybe 2019, um, have used um, uh, GAN images and other sort of um, artificial, um, artificially generated um, content, um, didn't necessarily make those operations more or less successful. Um, uh, and um, uh, the people that, you know, are benefiting from that scale that Laura was talking about are usually not going to be um, those um, coordinated and authentic behavior actors. They're more often going to be the people that do benefit from scale. And that are that is the people that are trying to make money on the Internet, right? Financially motivated threat actors stand to benefit a lot more um, from um, being able to scale their activities. And so that, that's the who piece. Um, and then the will it be successful? I think the reason I posed it, maybe um, unfairly, is if we, you know, uh, I don't remember who said this in sort of framing up this conversation, but we're here in 2024, and a lot of this conversation, um, you know, really began here in the United States and, you know, after 2016. But if we look at how many studies there actually have been on the impact of influence operations from Russia after 2016, there's one. One. 
Um, there's been a lot of studies admiring the problem and sort of investigating, trying to understand the threat actors themselves. But in terms of trying to sort of measure the impact, which is a really hard thing to do, there's been one and it was um, from, from NYU, actually. Um, and other than that, a lot of the studies are, you know, we have bad proxies for measuring impact, right? Um, when I worked at a technology company, those um, proxies were things like, okay, well, what can we say? What what information do we have to assess whether this was impactful? How many followers did someone have? How many accounts did they create? How many images did they post and things like that, right? We're trying to count things and we're trying to use that as a proxy for measuring impact. But if you look at some of the influence operations that were perhaps um, one could argue were more successful are the ones that maybe just created a few accounts and then were able to leak data, um, whether it was emails or other things, to in, um, news organizations and others who had a much higher platform and then were able to share that information, right? Um, uh, and so, you know, how do we actually measure impact? Is the impact on the outcome of, of an election? Is the impact on sort of broader societal trust and democracy? What are we measuring the impact of? And how do we even measure it is a really difficult question. And that's why, you know, that is often less studied than the others. Can I share some thoughts? Really enjoying the discussion so far. So I thought there were two, and I thought that was that was amazing. Uh, I I can I can dig up what I thought was the second one and send it after the call. And what was interesting is that in my recollection, both of those basically found that the effect was insignificant of uh, you know um, Russian activity on social media in terms of uh, voter attitudes or behavior. And I wonder if there were more studies that also found such null effects and therefore didn't publish. That's always one of the challenges with uh, scientific publishing as a way of getting at the truth. You never know how much is just not seeing the light of day. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, let's assume that this is going to be scaled up uh, and uh, you know, we have this liar's dividend problem. You never know what's a cheap fake and what is not. Um, so the question for me is what's next? I think for millennia, we've assumed that realism of media is an indicator of authenticity. I think that's going to go away regardless of, you know, who the threat actors are. Um, even at moderate scales, I think that is already starting to go away. So the question is what what's next? I think a lot of people are already turning to slash are going to turn to looking at the credibility of the entities from which they receive their news and information. Uh, I don't know if that's you know the best approach, but what are those new approaches going to be? And what are uh, social media platforms and others doing to enable some of those transitions? To me, those are some of the most exciting questions. And the answers to those questions don't really depend on how big a threat we think generative AI is, because they're also the answers to, you know, kind of plain old disinformation as well as Gen AI enabled disinformation. Uh, so I think there needs to be a lot more attention to those. Uh, so we've talked about content moderation a little bit, but things like, uh, you know, helping people understand uh, the credibility of uh, different organizations. So on X slash Twitter, you know, the blue check thing was obviously a big step backwards, but what are some step forwards that more responsible platforms can put into place? I think that is still very much a question that's worth exploring. We don't have clear answers to. I think Community Notes actually is a big step forward. It's unfortunate that it hasn't been deployed at a broader scale or by other platforms. Uh, and I, you know, I, I would be cautiously optimistic that in the coming years, there will be movement on those fronts. Can I maybe, yeah, maybe. And yeah. I'll also add in another kind of, because I know that um, you have a lot of expertise on the content moderation side. And so I was curious also, if, you know, in addition to thinking about this sort of what's different question, if you wanted to add a little bit about some of the other shifts in content moderation or in the online space, because, of course, you know, content, whether it's generated or just sort of trying to so discord in some way, um, it needs to be able to circulate to its preferred audience. And so that's the platforms that's, you know, we have to have that conversation in tandem, I think, with the generation question. And so maybe if you want to give a little bit more kind of in, in your view from the, the experiences that you've kind of seen in your expertise on that as well, in addition to whatever else you were hoping to add to the, the previous question. Yeah, absolutely. So, so two points that I think are interrelated, and the second one will will answer the the question you just asked. Um, I think the the big overall thing is, you know, the question of what's different. 
has to do in my mind in part with the particular place where again just just focusing on the united states here obviously these are the questions that are going to be grappled with around the world um that the us is in a uniquely vulnerable place right now in terms of the state of our democracy um and in terms of public trust in various institutions including the press and in in government more broadly and so uh one example of that and this is my first point uh what i was thinking of about you know the the particular difference that this new technology has now is uh, thinking about its relationship with news, um, and I you know I would call myself a journalist um, for better or for worse, and I think you know there's been a lot of anxiety um, in the journalism space around what generative AI, specifically ChatGPT, uh, pretends for journalism. I'm not a person who thinks that you know uh, we're going to be able to replace all reporters <laughs> with AI, but I am worried that there are people who own media companies who think that. Um, and that that is going to further deepen the real crisis that we have right now um, in local newsrooms. Um, and that, I think, is a problem in terms of thinking about election misinformation, because, you know, you need local newsrooms to be educating people about, you know, what they should expect when they head to the polls. So that if there's a story about, you know, ballots being burned or something like that, they know that there's a reporter or a newsroom that they can trust. They can go to the website, you know, flip on the television and find accurate information. And so if there is more and more of sort of a loss of the those local news connections because uh, journalists are being let go in exchange for sort of filling the internet with AI sludge, um, I think that that is a, a real problem that, you know, perhaps it wouldn't be a problem if we had a stronger ecosystem to support news in this country. Um, so then to, to your question, Valerie, I think that the sort of second manifestation of this is, as you say, what things look like on the platform end. Um, so what we have seen, I think I would argue this maybe starts in 2022, um, is a real kind of retrenchment on the part of tech platforms. And I think you also see it on the part of the government um, where there's there's been kind of this backlash against content moderation uh, broadly. I think you see this on the economic front. Um, Musk arguably started the trend by uh, really destroying uh, Twitter's or X's trust and safety team um, as part of slashing the company's overhead. But there's also a kind of ideological opposition to the idea that, you know, a platform should be engaged in moderation there. Um, but you also see, you've seen a lot of tech companies, uh, Meta among them, that have really, really had deep, deep cuts to their trust and safety teams as part of these larger layoffs that tech companies have been experiencing. Um, and so I think that raises questions, you can hear the siren there, apologies about that, uh, about the ability of platforms to engage in the kind of moderation that we're going to need, uh, particularly when it comes to generative AI. I'd also say, you know, we've, we've seen uh, pullback on the government end as well, um, I think in response to the sort of right-wing backlash um, against content moderation. There's been, a Meta has said that they haven't heard anything from the FBI's Foreign Influence Task Force in terms of uh, foreign influence operations since July. Uh, there's been a, a larger pullback um, from DHS as well. And so not only is there a sort of decreased interest in tech companies and engaging with this as a problem, there's less of the intelligence coming from the government to kind of help companies decide, you know, identify information that they might perhaps want to take down and then do that. So I think overall, the sort of the capabilities are more limited, even as there, there is this new type of information that we're concerned with. And just to follow on quickly to Quinna's point, um, the other party that has been receiving a significant amount of pressure on this is just researchers. Like uh, the entire research community um, has uh, been under a lot of pressure, um, you know, from the government on exactly this point. And I think that's, you know, that's kind of a critical piece in the way that both you and Arvind or Olga and Arvind highlighting, oh, there's maybe two studies, maybe it's one, maybe it's two, um, that look at these phenomena and how can we distinctly measure effects? We can't even get necessarily access to the likes um, or to the, the actual posts. And so I do think that that's a really big challenge 
in also being able to level set this conversation a little bit. So in my report, I used proxies for AI generated content because that's all you could get. And it was not even the best possibility. And so it's really hard to be able to scope out the challenge as well so that we can strike that, I think, measured ba balance between sort of concern and measured skepticism in this space. Uh, so maybe kind of keeping on the platform side a little bit, um, I know, so for those who follow, uh, Meta announced yesterday that they're going to be adding labels to AI-generated images. And I'm curious, maybe for Olga, given your experience, um, sort of what your thoughts are on this policy shift, um, what additional steps do you think that tech companies might be able to take? Um, and then maybe kind of zooming out a little bit, do you feel like this generative AI moment is different? Um, from a from a moderation perspective on the platforms or sort of just a continuation, whether that's through the foreign influence lens um, or just more broadly. Yeah, so I'll start with the the new policy. Uh, so that's something that probably, even though it was just announced, um, just to give people a window on how these things are developed, I imagine um, the teams that were working on this were working on it for quite a bit and sort of talking to researchers to understand sort of what do we do, um, you know, how do we best um, come up with a system that addresses the problem. Um, uh, I, I spent some time working on a different labeling um, policy um, on state controlled media, and you know a lot of those conversations were with media capture experts to try to understand um, what is actually the best thing you can do to address state controlled media that might be distinct um, from what you do with um, other problems. Um, and so um, something like that might have been in the works for a long time, um, but of course um, it is being announced um, now. Um, in terms of, you know, what it means, right, there are um, uh, content policy teams, right, that are distinct, again, importantly, from the people that are doing um, investigations and intelligence work, um, like the, the teams that I worked with. Um, and um, they're looking at how do we actually provide people with information about content that they're consuming. Um, uh, Arvin mentioned community notes. Um, so there's, you know, how do you engage the public um, and also trying to study whether there will be sort of um, second and third order effects of those labels, right? What does that mean? Um, how do people consume those labels? Is it going to cause some sort of um, backlash um, when people see it? Um, uh, and also, if you think about it, um, if let's say that there's a model that's detecting um, um, these images that might be artificially generated, um, but it doesn't detect some others. Does that mean that you can trust all the images that you see that don't have the label? Um, uh, so there's some questions around what is or isn't labeled and how, you know, again, we come down to the question that Arvin raised before, which is the sort of perception problem. Um, like, what does it actually mean for the consumer? Um, what happens in someone's brain when they see that information? Um, does it actually fundamentally change how they engage online? Will they still reshare it because they want to? To, um, and, and who shared it in the first place. Um, so those are some questions around that. In terms of what actually changes um, uh, in terms of generative, generative AI, uh, my old team at Meta um, publishes these regular threat reports, and they actually had, I was looking it up, um, in their latest threat report, that they put out, they had a section on generative AI, and they're sort of walking through the history of when they have seen this used in sort of coordinated influence campaigns, um, and when they haven't, and sort of what the what they um, were able to measure around the impacts of those things um, uh, in that last report. Um, having worked both on a threat intelligence team and a policy team, what I will say is that the policies that I worked on were content agnostic, which was really helpful because sometimes the, you know, influence operations that engage in sort of deception and manipulation are not actually sharing false content, right? Um, they are sharing something real, sharing a news story from legitimate news outlet, but using it for, to deceive. And so relying solely on content can be kind of problematic. There are also times where content can originate from real individuals and then later be repurposed and reshared by those engaging in influence operations. And so content is often a a sort of terrible way to start an investigation. Um, uh, usually um, the way in which um, this is investigated, not just at a company like Meta, but also um, at other technology companies that still have trust and safety and investigative teams um, is, um, you know, looking at someone's behavior and trying to understand anomalies, right? Um, the reason the policy was called coordinated authentic behavior was because you're looking for people that are lying about who they are and what they're doing and what they share is secondary. Um, but that's only if we're talking about sort of um, nation and non-nation state 
threat actors. Um, as Laura mentioned earlier, right, like we're talking about the whole ecosystem of individuals um, that may share um, manipulated content. And that's where the content moderation comes in, right? Um, there are intelligence and investigative teams that are still looking for behavioral based deception. Um, but on the content side, right, how do you scale detection of these techniques? How much is um, going to be based on um, uh, using artificial intelligence to detect artificial intelligence? How much of it is going to be based on having manual um, labeling that is happening um, by those content moderation teams? Um, how much do you need um, language expertise of people from different parts of the world to be able to label that content to be better sort of um, train um, the systems that are catching those things? And so there's an important, again, I'll, I'll keep making this distinction, like you, you know, the threat actors are very distinct from misinformed individuals who are sharing information that they truly believe to be true. You raised your hand so nicely. Yes. <laughs> Go on in. Yeah, I just wanted to add one quick point. I was happy to see this announcement from Meta. I've advocated for this kind of labeling in my own writing with uh, my co-author, Sayash Kapoor. Uh, the, perhaps the main reason I'm excited about it is one of the second order effects. Uh, Olga mentioned second order effects, in particular a negative one, which is very valid, which is that people might think everything that's not labeled is genuine information. While we should be concerned about that, I think one of the things I'm optimistic about is that this will keep uh, this will give people a good idea of the rapidly advancing envelope of Gen AI capabilities, which they, I think, currently don't have a great way to have. So I'm confused about this a lot of the time. So, I mean, I know, and I think a lot of people who spend time online know that, uh, you know, uh, images uh, can be very realistic and uh, uh, when they're AI generated. But what about videos? I mean, it changes from week to week where the capabilities are, and it's really hard to keep up with that. So, in the, in a, you know, most people are not going to take time to investigate the state of the technology and try to come to some informed uh, understanding of that. But if they see it on their feed from time to time, as they see month to month, the uh, realism of certain types of media uh, changing, I think that's really the best way to equip people with the literacy that they need to adapt uh, to, uh, to the changes in uh, technology capabilities. Gosh, you guys are so polite. Um, yeah, Laura. <laughs> um, this is something that occurred to me listening to um, Olga's comments and also came out in, in Arvin's. You know, Olga spoke about the need for platforms to have, you know, the same kind of language expertise as their users. But it actually goes beyond language. It's also cultural context. And I think, you know, when I think about how... Um, you know, I, I think this is one of the things that I am, again, I am worried about around um, the, uh, you know, around Gen AI content, because, um, you know, something that these tools are wonderful at is uh, the task of style transfer. So this is, I've got some kind of core content or message or idea, and I want to dress it up in, in different styles. So you've probably seen, like, here's a... Um, like here's a text memo in a sea shanty, right? Um, uh, that that's just style transfer, right? And so um, a lot of the culturally significant markers, the things that are relevant to one particular community, those are things that um, generative AI tools can actually be somewhat good at um, at wrapping around some kind of core message that they're that they've been asked to, you know, put this in the language of you know yoga moms or whatever it is, they're, they're pretty good at that, but they're definitely not perfect at it. And very often, um, you know, it's one of those things that uh, particularly people from those communities can tell the difference. Like they are the people who are best able to distinguish uh, this isn't real. This is this is uh, this is fake content. Um, I'm a university professor, if I'm not mistaken, Every, all of the other co-panelists either currently or formerly taught. Um, for So of, of my co-panelists, who has had work handed in that you are pretty darn sure came from ChatGPT? I have not, but only because I haven't <gasps> taught since ChatGPT came out. <laughs> I have had a conversation with my students this semester about what I expect them to use and not use it for, because I also don't want to deny the existence of the technology. I expect that they will use it in their lives and um, for their work, but I also, um, you know, want to warn them about what it looks like when they do use it too heavily. And I, I don't. Sorry. 
No, 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 Arvin, tell me. I was going to say I encourage my students uh, to use AI in doing their work, and I even paid for them to subscribe to GPT-4 if they thought that would help them do their work better. Yeah. I feel like this is a whole other panel conversation that we could have for sure. But I guess it sort of transitions in one way that I, you know, one of the the things that I that I think Amy hinted at as well, um, which I know some have been asking in the audience, is ways that these can be these tools can be used positively, and you know, thinking about in the context of elections potentially, or um, in the sort of AI research field. I know that this was also hinted at earlier, sort of using AI to detect AI. Um, I was curious amongst the kind of panel assembled here, uh, what your thinking is about the that you know, both the positive sides and the positive use cases, maybe um, in the election space in particular, and then also um, thinking about the ways that maybe the tools are evolving, if they're evolving quick enough, if you think there are things that are kind of ready for prime time um, to be able to help address some of these issues that we've been talking about. Feel free to jump in or raise your hand. Um, I, I have a quick thought. Um, you know, Quinta, when you were talking about journalism, um, uh, because I've, I've certainly heard this concern advanced, and I think, um, I think you know, we're going to have to see. I think one of the things that I actually feel hopeful about is um, I live in a very small town. Uh, we have a one very small news outlet in our very small town, and our very small news outlet in our very small town is one guy. There's like one person who goes to the town meetings and, you know, cracked that, like there was a huge mini scandal in my town that was cracked wide open by our one reporter who actually showed up to like Zoom town meetings that are like by law open to the public. And therefore the are these like public Zoom meetings that nobody expected anyone to ever go to. And, you know, it was, it was a whole little mini scandal that, is delicious and gossipy, but I will not, I will not take up your time with, but um, I know that that one guy cannot go to every meeting. He cannot, uh, even in my tiny town, he has to write the news stories and he has to sell the banner ad spaces and he has to like put together the community calendar. He, he just like, he cannot do all those things that he would like to do. And I think there is a lot of potential um, to help Steve do uh, you know, make our one news outlet a little bit better. And I absolutely hear the concern about the pullback from big corporations. But in a lot of places, that happened 20 years ago. You know, it, there isn't a big corporation, there's just Steve. And so, you know, I would like Steve to have as many tools as he can possibly can possibly have. And I do think that it's something that um, can help a lot of those small you know, one to two person newsrooms just do more with what they have. Yeah, that that's a really great point. I mean, and to the extent that having these tools widely avail available does allow, um, you know, does make journalist job easier, does allow information that is useful and, you know, valuable and true to be disseminated easy, excuse me, more, more sort of swiftly and fluidly, I think that's, that would be fantastic. I think on the, on the content moderation side, also, I know um, there's some interesting work that was recently published by uh, Dave Wilner, who used to be at OpenAI and Samit Chakrabarti, um, suggesting that you may actually be able to use LLMs to improve content moderation at scale. Um, so I, I do not have a technical background and I cannot speak to the technical aspects of it, but I know people who work in this field, um, it seems like some other folks on the panel as well from the nodding, um, are really excited about this and think that it, it might really help um, tech companies with content moderation processes, especially when there's just a huge volume of information um, in terms of improving you know, accuracy, particularly in other languages. Um, so to the extent that that pans out, I think that will potentially be a huge, huge help. I'll also say, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that um, I'm curious for, you know, some of the computer scientists on the panel to also, um, you know, maybe nod or if, if they agree, but I think, you know, we've all started talking about artificial intelligence. I think I can probably trace the moment when, you know, last May, every single, you know, event that I was going to all of a sudden became a conversation about a workshop about generative AI when it used to not be, right? Um, and part of that is because of the sort of broader public release of ChatGPT and people's public use of it. But that's the other thing I wanted to say is that there's, you know, 
artificial intelligence in general has been used by technology companies and computer scientists and machine learning techniques for much longer than sort of the public has been aware of it, right? Um, and I see some nods. Um, and I think both that both helps um, those computer scientists and technologists understand both the costs and the benefits of the uses of those technologies. But it also means that you know, for years now, um, I've been teaching a class on disinformation and influence, and I've always talked about generative techniques and artificial intelligence for four years now. Um, uh, it, it, it didn't just start, you know, this year, um, but it also means that technology companies have employed the use of artificial intelligence to help detect things like fake accounts, right? Um, fake accounts are used for all kinds of things that are not necessarily influence operations or disinformation. They're most often used, again, by spammers, scammers, and others um, engaging in fraud, and and um, there's a way to sort of label data enough that you're able to now, you know, have a score for how fake an account is, right? There are things that artificial intelligence or what we maybe didn't call artificial intelligence before was already being used to detect things like fake accounts, detect, um, you know, scaled um, resharing of content and other things like that. It's just that it is being used more. And, um, you know, I was also going to cite that report from Samid and Dave, um, sort of trying to explore um, ways in which this this can also be used in innovative ways to do content moderation work. It's wonderful. So we have just a few minutes left and I wanted to think um, maybe get your feedback um, and thoughts on the regulatory space um, just a little bit for our last couple of minutes because there is a lot of action in US Congress. We've seen lots of action in the European Union. I'm just curious in terms of thinking about this space in the next year, uh, sort of what do we think are possibilities in terms of these more narrow actions around sort of political deep fakes, maybe in advertisements, um, and then maybe in the absence of action, um, what are the potential downstream effects of something like the EU's DSA, um, the Digital Services Act, to help address some of these platform-specific um, issues that we've talked about throughout the conversation? So maybe, you know, whoever would like to chime in, um, address those questions or if you have also anything that you wanted to add before we wrap in um, just a couple minutes, um, do feel free now. I mean, I can kick us off. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Um, I mean, realistically, uh, and, and I say this as someone who is a huge fan of the AI executive order and the folks at NIST who have, um, you know, who are doing really excellent work, but that is not going to save us this year. And it's 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 just not that that's not the speed at which the the federal government operates. And similarly, um, you know, there is a a process happening in the European Commission. Um, you know, because remember, the United States is not the only place with uh, with an election this year. There's a lot of elections this year. Um, you know, and I think this is where, frankly, the thing that is going to make a difference to the degree that anything does, it's going to be what companies themselves decide to do, what their own policies um, are. And I really hope that they, um, you know, are taking this challenge seriously. I, I'm sure they are. And then the question just becomes, um, you know, what kind of resources they, they decide to put behind whatever decision they make. Now, you mentioned the DSA, and I think this is something where I am really hopeful about you know, the, the Brussels effect, because one thing that the DSA uh, allows for and certainly will happen is uh, there's going to be external research about whatever platforms decide to do, however they choose to, uh, you know, look for uh, AI generated content, whether they decide to just allow it, there's going to be research into whatever their, uh, whatever their platform behavior actually is. I'm 100% certain that some researcher will choose to do that. That seems like it's um, uh, research in the public interest around a systemic risk. So somehow it will make it through the DSA process. And, you know, I'm sure platforms are thinking about the fact that whatever they do, you know, it's going to be studied. So that's where I'm hopeful. I just want to footstop the point that Laura just made, which is 
it's, you know, it's interesting. We all have all these panels and it's an election year, but if you study any of, you know, the campaigns that have tried to interfere in elections or manipulate um, election time periods, um, they are not usually just focused on the election. They're focused on the broader information environment. And we tend to sort of get excited about the idea um, of elections as a framing concept for this so that we can have conversations like this one. But the reality that sort of brings us back to the points that were made at the very beginning is that information and environment, um, the ecosystem, liberal democracies and all these things, you know, they're constantly dealing with these challenges, whether it's an election year or not. Um, and so I think it's important to sort of place it in the context of that and to say that if someone was going to engage in some kind of interference, they're already doing it. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, as, as Laura said, it's it sort of it, it's too late for regulation to stop it. But there, you know, the one thing I'm encouraged by is if you look at, you know, sort of the movement on Capitol Hill, there has been bipartisan legislation proposed. And that, unfortunately, is a rarity these days, right? Um, and that doesn't mean that it's necessarily passing, but um, there's a you know, vested interest from both Republicans and Democrats to have campaigns not use generative um, imagery and video content because they've seen both respective uh, parties targeted with it, right? Um, and so there is some consensus that you see um, uh, around that in the United States and then, um, you know, certainly around the world as well. Yeah, so maybe Arvind and then Quinta, and then we will wrap um, for the day. So on that note of uh, broadening how we look at it, let me also put in a word for non-AI specific interventions. You know, AI specific interventions are also necessary, but we've uh, talked a bit on this panel about how the reason why this is so problematic is because of the decline of the media. Let's fund investigative journalism. You know, maybe that's not an issue for legislation. I know, Valerie, your question was about AI-specific legislation for 2024. And what I'm talking about is not AI-specific. It's not legislation. It's not for 2024. But I do think it's always helpful to keep the bigger picture in mind. I appreciate you going wherever you wanted. So <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I, I cannot second that enough. I mean, I think that that would be a... Uh, enormous, enormous help. I mean, I think in terms of, you know, tools that are available, um, we need more support for election workers. Um, they need more support, you know, just within this space, they need support uh, from the federal government in terms of thinking about how to counter uh, falsehoods that they receive. Currently, uh, we know that there's been a bit of a pullback on that from um, CISA, the Cybersecurity and Information Security Agency, which played that role in 2020. They're focusing more on sort of harder, so to speak, cyber issues this time around. But uh, that kind of leaves local election workers in a bit of a tough spot where, you know, are they the ones that are supposed to, you know, pick up the phone and, and call Meta, which isn't actually even something that you can do. Um, and, and so I think having that, those kinds of uh, partnerships to, to help them deal with, you know, people who are uh, bringing up rumors that they're uncertain about is, is really, really helpful. I think also, you know, What's important to keep in mind when we're thinking about particularly uh, informa misinformation from generative AI that could, you know, uh, mislead voters like the, the New Hampshire robocall, there are laws on the books to deal with that. Um, it is illegal <laughs> under federal law and in, in, I believe in New Hampshire under state law as well to deceive voters and try to trick them out of voting. We've seen this. There is a, a federal prosecution um, of a, a pro-Trump Twitter troll who was trying to sort of trick people out of voting in 2016. There are laws on the books. And so I think keeping in mind that, um, as Ervin says, you know, this is one manifestation of a bigger problem. And there are tools that are available, not perfect tools, not necessarily well suited to, you know, every aspect of the novelty of this problem. Um, but we're not totally empty handed. Well, on that note, I think that's a great note to conclude on. Thank you all for joining the panel, sharing your insights. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, this was a wonderful conversation, um, and I'm looking forward to continuing it in the years years ahead, um, both specifically with respect to elections, but also more broadly, ways to build up that information space, build up that trust. Um, and uh, I look forward to, to having you all um, along again. And thank you so much to everybody um, for, for this wonderful conversation. So with that, I will say goodbye.